Good morning. Welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Here are the headlines. Ukrainian commander says a bloody battles are still being fought at the Azovstal steel works plant. Ukrainian authorities are reporting a shelling at a residential area of Kramatyorsk, killing five people in Luhansk. And the UK is putting together another £45 million to help vulnerable people in Ukraine, just as the US uh, ships military hardware into Ukraine. Thanks for joining us this morning. Ukrainian forces are still inside the Mariupol Azovstal steel works plant and are fighting difficult bloody battles, so says the commander of the far-right Azov regiment. In a video message released on Telegram, he said he was proud of his soldiers who were making superhuman efforts at containing the pressure of the enemy, referring, of course, to the Russian forces. Russia's military says it would pause military activity during the 5th, 6th and 7th of May to allow civilians to evacuate from the steel plant where civilians and defenders are holding out against the Russian forces who have seized the city. Well, President uh, Volodymyr Zelensky says there needs to be continued silence in order to rescue more people still trapped in the Azovstal steel plants. Uh, negotiations, he says, are continuing in the hope that they will be rescued, not just from the plant, but also from Mariupol. He said this in his regular evening videos posted online. President Zelensky says the Ukrainian side is ready to provide the necessary silence as it takes time to lift people out of those basements and out of underground shelters. Officials say some 200 civilians as well as Ukrainian fighters are still holed up in the plant's network of underground bunkers. He's also confirmed 344 civilians have been evacuated from Mariupol and are on their way to the Ukrainian-controlled city of Zaporizhia. And they will get the necessary assistance uh, to be treated in the most supportive manner by the state. The latest evacuation comes after dozens of evacuees who took refuge for weeks in the bunkers of the Azostel Steel Works reached the safety of Zaporizhia on Tuesday. President Zelensky says he's spoken to Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett and discussed the so-called scandalous and completely unacceptable remarks by Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov about Hitler being Jewish. In an early morning video address, President Zelensky said the comments by the Foreign Minister outraged the entire world. And those attacks are still continuing in cities across Ukraine. Five people have been killed in the Luhansk region, so says the governor, Sergei Dai. He also says the shelling focused on Severodonetsk and Popsana, Hersky and Lyshansk are continuing. Shelling has been reported in residential areas of the center of Kramatyo City, destroying several multi-story buildings, a school and a kindergarten. At least six people were wounded in the attacks. The UK's Prime Minister Boris Johnson is set to meet with his Japanese counterpart, uh, Fumio Kishida. It will be expected to discuss new ways of applying pressure on Russia in its war in Ukraine. The meeting will also focus on helping those allied against Russia to become less dependent on its oil and gas. Japan, a member of the G7, is part of the Western alliance defending Ukraine and has condemned the invasion, imposed sanctions on Russia and sent non-lethal military to Ukraine. Uh, speaking of those uh, weapons headed for Ukraine, the howitzers are being transported as part of U.S. military aid. Just last week, President Joe Biden asked Congress for $33 billion to support Ukraine. It's seen as a dramatic escalation of U.S. funding for the war with Russia. Also, Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby says recent Russian strikes in western Ukraine were aimed at critical infrastructure sites. He told reporters just a while ago they were attempted to hit what we assess to be critical infrastructure targets out towards the west electrical power, transportation hubs, the kind of thing. We think this is an effort to try to disrupt the Ukrainians' ability to replenish and reinforce themselves. He says authorities are still assessing the degree to which uh, to which they hit what they're targeting as they are not good precision strikes. 
Keeping his eye on developments out of Ukraine, President Joe Biden says he'll be speaking with leaders from the G7 this week about potential additional sanctions against Russia. With regard to the additional sanctions, we're always open to additional sanctions. And I've been in consultation. I'll be speaking with the members of the G7 this week about what we're going to do or not do. The UN says at least one in six UNICEF-supported schools in eastern Ukraine has been damaged or destroyed since the start of the war, including schools uh, 36, the only safe schools in Mariupol, underscoring dramatic impact the conflict is having on children's lives and their futures. Uh, two schools have been hit by attacks in the past week alone. The damaged or destroyed schools, 15 of 89, are part of the Safe Schools program established with the Ministry of Education and Science, primarily in response to attacks on kindergartens and schools in the Donbass region, which has seen a simmering armed conflict since 2014. Since the outbreak of the war in February, hundreds of schools across the country are reported to have been hit due to the use of heavy artillery, airstrikes, and other explosive weapons in populated areas whilst others are being used as information centers, shelters, supply hubs, or for military purposes. For children affected by crisis, school is critical, providing them with a safe space and a semblance of normality in the most difficult of times and ensuring they are not paying a lifelong price for missed learning. Education can also be a lifeline, providing children with access to information on the risks of deadly explosive ordnance and connecting them and their parents to essential health and psychosocial services. Weeks into the war in Ukraine, frantic efforts were being made to help evacuate foreigners, especially students, out of crisis-hit areas, Kherson, Sumy, you can name them. Many of those humanitarian efforts were being coordinated by people outside of Ukraine, people miles and miles away in countries across the Atlantic. Are just ordinary people brought together by a common cause to get innocent civilians out of the war zone. In the course of our coverage over the weeks, we spoke to two such coordinators there with the Diaspora Relief and, where, and are still focused on helping Nigerians and Africans leave Ukraine's shelled cities and to resettle in neighboring countries. Danielle Onyekwere and Fumi Adeleye Oladejo join me now. Danielle is in Texas, Fumi is in Maryland. Ladies, thank you both for joining me this morning. I know it's really early where you are. Good morning. Good morning. Well, if we could just see your faces, I'm sure the viewers are wondering who I'm speaking to. At the last time we spoke, we were both coordinating evacuations out of Kherson, right? So how, how are you today? And, and what's the update? Okay, I'll go. Daniel. Um, we're good. We're good, and um, it's it's been a long, um, excruciating, um, draining journey, but we're good. And um, so far, we don't we know that there are no Africans left in Kherson. Um, the the last batch was um, left, like I think, about two weeks ago, and um, so right now, all we're just doing is maintaining. Um, Maintenance, that's what we're doing. So making sure that people are housed, are fed. Um, we have them scattered all, we have students scattered all over Eastern Europe. We have them in Germany, Slovakia, Switzerland, um, Austria, Netherlands, um, Poland, Slovakia, Moldova. So it's just maintenance right now um, and keeping them, keeping them, keeping their spirits up. I, I thought that the war would be over because in 2014, something like this happened, but it wasn't of this magnitude. So I thought that we'll be done by now and everybody will be going back to rebuilding and structuring. But here we are, you know, just not knowing what will happen tomorrow. D Danielle, it, we, uh, Fumi mentioned 2014. Um, this, but, but did you do the same thing? Were you both, were you both partners then in 2014 uh, coordinating relief efforts and evacuations as well back then? No, no, no. 2014, I, I was just like, just got out of, <laughs> got, just got out of high school, was just, you know, finishing my life. It wasn't, I 
didn't have any humanitarian thing going on. Just, you know, this is the first time I actually merged myself into something like this. So you could tell that I, it was a lot, um, was unorganized, not planned. And it just, everything was just spontaneous happening as it goes. So for both of you, and I know that, you know, viewers uh, did follow your story back then when we first told it, uh, but for those who don't know, two of you, you're both living in two different states in the United States. You both got interested, you know, in what was going on in Ukraine when you saw the videos of Nigerians and, you know, African students who were stranded, you know, in cities uh, such as Sumi, in Kherson, and then you started rallying support, you know, for those Nigerians. Help us understand, you know, why you did this, why you started doing this even though you were just thousands of miles away from where these people were? I think it was a video. It was one video that we saw where it started off with the lady with the baby in the cold. So, and people were looking for her. People were like, where is she rallying for her? Now she has a newborn baby. The baby wasn't even up to three months old, I think, at the time we saw the video and the video went viral. So from there, we joined on to a Twitter space. And then that's how everything, you know, people are looking for resources. We started digging for resources. We started coordinating and um, we're able to gather a big group of volunteers that uh, were able to join us and start um, the whole evacuation process. So the donations came in via like just running spaces and, you know, sharing our donation links and things. And then that's how we we're able to get funding to be able to help get the people out. So, you know, I said previously, you know, in the other, you know, um, interview we had about how, you know, a, a lot of these people are facing racism. So they were choosing Ukrainians over the Africans or over the Black people. Just, um, you know, people of color were being chosen last. It was like, oh, let's evacuate our people and you you guys figure out your way, you know? And it even got to the point of where they were charging people $700, $500 per head just to evacuate. And, you know, at that time where you just left everything, you don't have anything, you don't have any money, when you're just on the run and you're trying to flee from Ukraine, it's like, where do you get that kind of money? And it's not something that you planned for. Um, so that's where it really started was just from seeing that video, seeing the video of the people being pushed off the trains, seeing the video of the baby in the cold. A lot of people got sick, you know, uh, during this whole period and trying to uh, trying to evacuate and, you know, not seeing, you know, a lot of you know, media attention outside of just, you know, Ukraine and maybe Nigeria paying attention to the people outside. You know, I feel like, you know, U.S. media paid a lot of attention to the Ukraine war, but not so much on the Africans being, um, uh, facing racism or just, you know, other, you know, other people facing racism. They, it wasn't that much media attention on it. Um, and still isn't, you know, so, um, that's where everything just sparked. Uh, Fumi, what was it for you? Um, so for me, it was, um, on the 20, I think the 25th, um, I went on a space and I just heard like horrific stories of people trying to leave Ukraine. It is a war there. There's this, I mean, we heard the rumors that there was, going, there was going to be a war. I was following the news, but I didn't think it would happen. Even if it did, I thought we lived in a more civilized, um, environment and that, um, with America, with UK, with all these um, Western bodies, that this war it won't get, it won't come to this. So I just monitored the story and I put out a tweet that you know praying for everyone in Ukraine have a plan B. On the twenty fifth, I got on the space and I had all kinds of stuff happening, like people trying to like the shelling had started in Kiev. Um, it it started. The action was on, and I was like, okay. Let's go. What what do we need? What can we give? We donate. I donated, and then I said, it, 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 it. "Donation." I donated, but it, at, at that point, it was beyond that because I had someone crying. So I had a, a, while I was in space, I had the siren going on, and I had somebody crying. Please help us! Please help us! We don't know what you know. It was just like what. So I stopped. I was like, and I, I requested for the mic, and I was like, "Listen." We want to help. But how many Nigerians are actually here? How many Black people are actually here to begin with? Because I know Ukraine is a medical hub. But I didn't think that, you know, it was that many Nigerians there. And it was like, oh, we're 1,000. No, we're 4,000. No, we're 10,000. I was like, wait, what? Whoa. Okay, where are you guys? Like, we're everywhere. Yeah. yeah, I was like, they're like, we're everywhere. I'm like, what does everywhere mean? So I was like, so 
before we knew what was going on, people were like, we're working to the Poland Polish border. I was like, walking to the Polish border. So I took out the map and I was like, where is where's Ukraine? Where's Poland? You're walking to where? So at that point, you know, you had to be, you just had to be a stone not to be moved by what was going on. You had to like ha have no heart in you not to want to do something. And I have always had this pang for humanity. Like I've always done humanitarian work up and down, you know, the coast. I have an NGO actually, apart from Diaspora Relief that me and I just co-founded. I had um, Project Hope, but I was focusing more of on Nigerian people in Nigeria. So I just jumped in. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what was going to happen. I just jumped in. And as the horrific video started pouring in, I, I, had, a, I had a source on, on, on ground. I met him on space. His name is Michael. And he's a medical student in Poland. So he left his, his, um, his studies and drove to the Medica border. And he was giving me live feed. So I was getting like live videos of everything that was happening there. It was, it was, it was, it was horrific. At some point, they were like, don't kill us. If you like, kill us. You can't finish killing us. I'm like, ah. people are trying to escape. You want to kill them again. Like, what is, like, the barbaric the barbaric nature of this situation, I have never witnessed. I, I, I mean, God, I pray that none of us see a war because these children have been through hell and back. Like, they had guns pointed at them. They had them at gunpoint trying to cross, like move, you know, they wanted Ukrainians to pass. They wanted other nationals to go through. They were like right. pushing them through, you know, so, okay, so let's, you let's, had to know. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to cut you short. I know we, 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 we've heard the stories before and we've seen, you know, the pictures and thanks to both of you, um, uh, scores of Nigerians have left, scores of Africans have left in Ukraine, and you're now trying to help them to settle, right, in uh, different countries, in uh, neighboring countries, uh, Hungary, Romania, and, and uh, a, a number of other countries. Could you tell us, you know, how that's going and um, what the challenges have been for both of you? So, um, the challenge is, the major challenge is funding because it's expensive. We had um, Airbnb vouchers that, you know, you know, Airbnb did something with giving out free vouchers for students um, that will last a month, but this is already past a month. So now we're having to pay for accommodation, pay for Airbnb, um, pay for feeding. Um, the Muslims just finished their fasting, so we had to like support the Muslim community with their whole um, fasting um, situation because we have quite a number of them in asylum camps that um, when they feed them in the morning, they give them, I think, food at like around 9 a.m. and then dinner was like around, I don't know, weird timing, and they had to eat early and eat late. So we had to sort that out. So um, and education too. We're looking for universities that will take them on. We've had so, so, so many meetings with different universities. And I can't even keep tab anymore of how many people we sat down to talk to about educational assistance, like schools absorbing the students into their system. Um, it's slowly happening, slowly, very slowly. But we hope that in the coming um weeks as this as they create better laws to absorb them it will get better germany is a good one right now germany is processing them but not for education particularly because you know in germany you have to go through the whole um, language studies before you are able to actually go to medical school so a lot of the students in germany we have um we have verifi we've verified with them that they are already in language school, that are under our care. They already do their language studies. And it's through some partnership that we found, it's free of charge. The, the NGO that we found that we're working with in Germany paid for all of their language courses. But that's not the case for everybody. We have so many other situations, but it's perhaps, just one day at a time that we are right now, yeah. Yeah, per perhaps, Danielle, you, you, you could complete that part and tell us what else you know you guys are going through, um, how you're helping people resettle. You're still doing a lot more uh, behind the scenes, even though you know, you're not posting a lot of that on social media and in spaces where people can see, but there's still so much going on behind the scenes, right? Absolutely, yeah. Like, we still have the people in Nigeria. You know, when we, you and I spoke earlier, I you know, mentioned the concern of, you know, the people that went back to Nigeria basically just 
a majority of them are either they stop their school completely because they are not able to afford the data that requires, you know, that is required for them to be able to maintain online schooling or, you know, we have the people that the data is too expensive. So we've been providing um, data for the people in Nigeria to be able to continue to online school. I know some of them, a lot of them actually expressed concerns about wanting to come back, but it's like, well, how do you come back? You know, like now it's not really, you know, the, the, all the laws that are being placed are not really favorable to third country nationals. So the people that are staying, you know, in these ne neighboring countries are staying on a temporary basis. Mm -hmm. You know, like we have the people in Hungary now, they're doing their school on online. Um, so their school in Ukraine is still doing online classes. So they're just like, you know, staying put for now, trying to do their online classes until they figure out, you know, a lot of them had the idea that once the war stopped, they would go back. But yeah. from what we're seeing in the news, clearly, you know, it, that's not something that we can predict that it's going to end, you know, tomorrow or end next month. So we're trying to work with the people in Nigeria, also work with the people, you know, all over. Um, and we've been less, you know, at posting just because we've been trying to, we've been having two, a lot of meetings trying to gather things and resources that are going to be able to help these students. A lot of them express concerns about wanting to, you know, work, like, can we work and be able to use that money to take care of ourselves? They're looking for long-term options. So when, if they were Ukrainian citizens, I feel like the, the laws favor Ukrainian citizens, but being third country nationals has been so difficult mm -hmm. trying to find resources but we'll, we'll keep pushing on and keep trying and keep you know mm -hmm. trying to you know push down every door we can to you know see what we can do to help these people out well Fumi and Danielle I know you both have lots of stories to tell um some that you can't tell here not in this space of course uh but others mm -hmm. that you're, you're dealing with and the other challenges that are going on behind the scenes which you are secretly holding to your chest. I do understand that. Um, we're with you. <laughs> we're with you on this journey. We thank you for what you've been doing. We wish you, you all of the best. Uh, and reach out to thank us you. whenever you can. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much thank for you having so us. Much. Thank you for having us. And we'll be coming back after the break. Welcome back. More funding has been announced for the Ukrainian people, this time from the United Kingdom, which says it is preparing a £45 million package for UN agencies and charities working to support those most vulnerable to abuse and harm. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss said in a government statement, British aid is supporting the most vulnerable in Ukraine, particularly women and children who are facing increased risk of sexual violence and exploitation. Officials say this is how the money will be distributed. 15 million pounds will go to the UN Ukraine Humanitarian Fund. 15 million pounds will also go to the UNICEF, a UN's agency for children. And 10 million pounds will fund humanitarian organizations in border countries to protect women and children who are fleeing there. 5 million pounds will go to the International Federation of the Red Cross in Ukraine. There will also be an additional 20 million pounds provided for humanitarian aid to Ukrainian refugees in Poland. Now, this latest funding brings to 220 million pounds, a package for Ukraine. Protesters for and against support to Ukraine demonstrated in the Bulgarian capital, Sofia, on Wednesday, as lawmakers voted on how much support to give the country in its fight against the Russian invasion. Both sides, one calling for increased support to Ukraine's government and another pressing for Bulgaria to stay neutral, scuffled in front of a monument to the Soviet army. Protester Kirill Chukhanov has said those in support of military aid to Ukraine thought, pros uh, thought proposals being debated in parliament did not go far enough. Bulgaria's parliament voted on Wednesday to allow repairs of Ukraine's heavy military equipment and seek ways to help Ukrainian exports of grains and electricity. But circumvented proposals to provide direct military aid to Kyiv. Ukrainian flag and held up signs of red, stop funding Putin's war, boycott Russian business today and save the children. And they draped the fearless girl statue, which faces the New York Stock Exchange, and the Ukrainian flag and put a small Ukrainian flag sticker on her chest. Uh -huh. 
Да. Давайте, девчата, поруч с прапорами. Joining me now in the studio is a security expert, Ola Dendi Ariel. Thank you for being here this morning. Good morning. You just showed me the hotel in Sofia where I embarked my 58th birthday some 12 years ago. Oh, wow. Look at us. Just bringing you memories without even knowing. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you're, you're, seeing, you're seeing the protests going on, and you know, right. th there's so much, so much support, so much reaction to what's going on in Ukraine. What do you think is driving this? Is it's, it... all, it's all expected. I've always said that um, the UN is um, a bulldog without any stitch and has no bite. Because if you had a bite, things wouldn't have gone this way. What we experienced was a throwback to the days of Pharaoh in the Bible, who would just wake up and invade you know, any of the small countries around it, take over their land, take over, I mean, um, impound their king or royalties or whatever, and then they become a part of Egypt. I never imagined that in today's world, with the advancement of technology, science, and management, especially in human development and human management, Somebody would just wake up from somewhere. Whatever the grievance Putin might have had, it went too far. And that is, each time you bomb a building, we are in a building now. Mm. If anybody says he wants to go and hit Channel TV, God forbid. God forbid. Right. <laughs> we are in this building. If you bomb the building, you are killing people. For every bombing that took place, human lives were lost. And unfortunately, they just give figures, 200. Who went in to count them? The debris was so terribly um, created that nobody that had his head on his neck would attempt to go in there. It was double risk because you were not sure of coming back alive. There could be unexpired um, bombs there. And then, of course, the building could come down on people. That we are witnessing this at this day and time is unfortunate. So people protesting is the only way of saying we are not pleased. And they can only protest in their home country sending messages through their home government to the UN. Yeah, but you know, there's this argument about whether um, countries should send aid, uh, military aid, or they should send humanitarian aid, or they should remain neutral. <laughs> and I've heard analysts say that Africa should remain neutral in all of this. Um, is it possible to remain neutral in the world that we live in, you know, when there's crisis or, or war happening somewhere else? I'm going to leave Africa out of my consideration. <laughs> because why, why is that? <laughs> the entire African I mean, continent is battling with instability, insecurity, economic crisis, and several other teaching challenges. So they are already, already bogged down. It will be a waste of resources <laughs> for any African country, including our golden boy, Rwanda, to think that they can get involved, <laughs> okay? Because yep. it may have their consequences. I had Putin in one video saying that any African country that got involved in this crisis will be wiped off the surface of the earth. I don't want to put anything past him to that extent. Now, all the other countries who are protesting, don't forget that they are all neighbors. They're within the same region and within the same hemisphere. So getting to deal with them is not going to be a big deal for Russia. But then, will the world fold their arms and be watching such carnage, you know, unleashed on human beings and not offer assistance. Again, in offering assistance, are you going to now be offering humanitarian aid assistance or military aid? Because if you are offering... What do, what do you think Ukraine needs right now? I don't... I, you see, <laughs> I have my way. I will arrest their president and kill him. He led the country the into this... Yeah, he led them into this nonsense. I mean, you knew your capacity, your strength, militarily. And perhaps he was um, led into believing that, don't worry, if anything happens, we're here for you. Unfortunately, something has been happening, and nobody is willing to come out and say, oh, yeah, let's go. Okay, we've moved past that conversation where, you know, we're wondering what was running through uh, President Volodymyr Zelensky's mind. But I also want to point out that Ukraine is a sovereign state. Nobody is doubting and, that. And, yes. And, but in and your the, sovereignty, and the and the in your sovereignty, you must also be able to assess your capacity to fend off um, 
What, uh, what uh, about what about an the, invader? Yeah, but what about the parts where the the Russians, the Russian president said he had no intentions of invading Ukraine? and yet he still did it. Now, let's move forward now. May 9th <laughs> is the next date now that eyes are focused on, and that's because on this day, it is suspected that Russia will be declaring victory over Ukraine. Do you think that will still happen, even though Russia says, no, we have no plans to do that? <laughs> um, if they've been planning a, a humanitarian pause uh, for May uh, 5th, 6th, and 7th um, to allow civilians leave Mariupol. Do you think that Russia can be trusted at this point, As President it is, Putin's words. If I can, if my reading of Putin's mind is sent to go by, he's tired. Okay, and I can tell you, technically and surreptitiously, they're looking for ways to end the carnage, because it's not when they say Russia and Ukraine crisis. I mean, war. It's not Russia and Ukraine. It's Russia hitting Ukraine, because all. I mean, when you when you try to weigh the consequences of the war, it's a lot way there the damage on the part of Ukraine. To that extent, especially when the world powers who should have frontally intervened are being careful, you know, being pussy-footed in their reactions, I would rather the entire world, <laughs> maybe in prayer or supplication or mere wishes, okay, <laughs> we look forward to Putin uh, respecting his commitments. And then we can begin to think of winding down the crisis so that Ukraine as a nation can now go back to the process of rebuilding. Because as it is, I was in Syria, in Damascus, before the damage. Mm. And I was in Damascus after the damage. Without being an indigenous, a tourist for that matter, I was in tears. I was imagining the number of lives lost and what it will take them in terms of money, competencies, capacities to rebuild Damascus. Now, looking at um, Kiev and other countries in the uh, cities in Ukraine, it's the same feeling I'm, I'm getting. So the earlier we put an end, the better. Yeah, but can this war end without negotiations? Because Russia is refusing to come back to the table. They're saying the Ukrainians are deceiving them. The Ukrainians are saying, well, Russia is deceiving us. Nobody wants to get back to the no, table. Don't forget that. Everybody's still holding on to what they, you know, yeah, what they're doing. Don't forget that. There's a working relationship or accord between Russia and China. Whether we like it or not, China has become an economic power to be reckoned with, not like the China of old. To that extent, um, I'm sure they are talking, okay? And you can also see that America, UK, and their allies, the, the NATO allies too, they are not um, reacting, you know, violently, so to say. What, what do you mean by reacting they, violently? They were not, I mean, I've not seen them coming out boldly to say we're going to be fighting Russia well, no, because of Ukraine. But there were a few moves which are, for me, very insignificant, considering the volume and the magnitude of the damage done to Ukraine. They, they never promised to put boots on the ground. Anyway. No, but, they never promised to fight No, the they, they wouldn't promise, but you will expect that if you are allies, you and I, we, are, we, we may not be um, colleagues, so to say, but if I drive by and I see you in distress, naturally, I want to stop by and ask if I could help. Okay, little if it's me. So what would I have expected all of that? So I can tell you that at the global level, there are the moves to bring down all of it. Because it has to come to an end. The world has to move on. When, Ukraine has to restart, you know, nation building. When, when, when do you think this war will end? And how do you think it will end? That's a big question. How I wish I'm Google. <laughs> um, well, people have been gambling, but I can tell you that it will not exceed me. Hmm. It will not exceed me. Because... When you look at it, in respect, Putin will have been asking himself questions. Haven't I gone too far? But for me, it's going to end in ICC for war crimes against humanity. You really think so? I, I mean, <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are cases in history. Manuel of uh, Norega, you remember the man? He, he, was, he got himself involved. Chancellor of Liberia, Dito, I mean, there are several other, but I can readily remember those two cases. Okay, so let's talk about the, um, the millions of dollars that are going into Ukraine. Um, the UK yesterday announced 300 million pounds 
uh, for military assistance for Ukraine. Today they're announcing uh, an additional 45 million for oh, humanitarian yeah, efforts. Yeah. The US is asking for $33 billion. Are they, are they um, indirectly funding this war? I don't want to see it as indirectly funding the war. In their shoes, I probably won't have announced the military financial assistance. Okay, even if that will be, I would rather we focus on humanitarian assistance because um, houses, people have lost their houses, lost their businesses, their everything. Some have just nothing beyond the dresses they have on their bags. So we shouldn't be, they shouldn't have been looking at that end because um, it's not, as it is, Ukraine does not need military assistance. No, I they know. need diplomacy, diplomatic assistance. Okay, if it takes... But what should they do while, you know, yeah, the Russians, yeah, because, Russian forces are coming out? Yeah, but, they, yeah, but like I told you, I didn't mean I'm a world... Like I'm Nigerian president now. I probably would have gone to Putin if it means frustrating, begging him to put an end to the carnage because it's against humanity, it's against common sense. There is nothing that can justify what they have gone through in Ukraine. So I'd rather they focus on bringing peace about, perhaps through the back door, okay? and not um, aggravating or escalating. Because when Putin heard, oh, they've given them money, military aid, yeah, his, his, he, he, might, he might, you know, send him the wrong signal. He's, talk, he's talked about that, and it, he's warned countries uh, uh -huh. from sending uh, military aid to Ukraine. And uh, Russian forces, uh, Russian missiles have actually been attacking, you know, some of the military depots where some of these weapons are being stored. Um, security expert Olade Indiario, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate your joining us. I hope I'll end the nice CC anyway. <laughs> thank <laughs> well, you very much for we'll having see. me. We'll see. And coming up after the break, President Zelensky continues his address to the world this time, speaking to the Danish parliament. Stay with us. Welcome back to our special coverage. Hungary cannot support a proposed European Union embargo on crude oil imports from Russia as that will destroy its energy security. That's according to Foreign Minister Peter Sijato. The Brussels package, he says, of sanctions would ban oil shipments from Russia to Europe with a rather short notice in case of Hungary in by the end of next year. He also said in a Facebook video that Hungary cannot support the measures in their current form. The minister said Hungary could not agree these measures if crude oil imports from Russia via pipeline were exempted from the sanctions. The new punishments announced by European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen on Wednesday included sanctions on Russia's top bank and a ban on Russian broadcasters from European airways as well as the embargo on crude oil in six months. Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi thanked Japan for swiftly agreeing to redirect liquefied natural gas cargoes destined for third countries to Europe. Europe, which sources about 40% of its gas imports from Russia, has been scrambling to diversify its energy supply mix as the conflict in Ukraine escalates. The European Commission this month is expected to unveil plans to help try to end Europe's reliance on Russian energy, expanding renewable energy faster, and replacing Russian gas with alternative supplies. Speaking after a bilateral meeting with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida in Rome, Draghi said the country's condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine and are committed to reaching a truce even local wants to evacuate citizens and favoring peace negotiations with Russia. Yoshida says he has agreed with Draghi. It's important for international community, including the G7, to respond resolutely to this invasion. And it's the duty of both Japan and Italy to do their utmost to support the Ukrainian government and its people. We'd earlier told you that uh, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson will be meeting his Japanese counterpart sometime today. And they're expected to discuss uh, a plan to support Asian nations in diversifying away from Russian oil and gas. The EU plans to ban Russian oil over the next six months and refined fuels by the end of the year to increase pressure on President Vladimir Putin uh, over his invasion of Ukraine. The bloc is also targeting ensure us in a move that could dramatically impair Moscow's ability to ship oil 
from around the world. Our business correspondent, Amy John Mekwa, is here. I have to emphasize that because <laughs> I made that mistake yesterday. I can't make it twice. I know, right? <laughs> so, to business now. Yes. Um, that meeting that the UK Prime Minister is expected to have with the Japanese Prime Minister, mm. we saw Kishida in Italy, uh, both of them talking about, you know, how to go about this Russian oil thing. Do you think that uh, Japan, um, you know, has more to lose or more to gain, you know, from this <laughs> this crisis that it's currently going on and what the European Union is planning to do? Well, um, let's just say everybody has things to lose and things to gain, you know. Uh, but it's also important to note that uh, this effort by the UK is not just about Japan. It's, it's about, you know, the Asian countries, uh, countries like China, who depend heavily on Russian oil, and India. India, in fact, has been milking the, uh, this opportunity, and now they're asking that oil, which is currently this morning at about 108, Brent is about $108. India is asking that it be sold for $70 uh, per barrel for them, a huge discount they're asking for. And you don't blame them because uh, insurance companies do not want to insure uh, cargoes that have Russian oil anymore. Banks do not want to have transactions. They're not making money available for such transportation. Is and it logistics. because of the sanctions? Yeah, because of the sanctions. Okay. And because, you know, if you are now um, assisting, then you might get caught up or you might get a hammer on your own head also, you know, so that's why uh, um, India and uh, the other Asian countries are asking for $70 instead of uh, like $108, which it is at, at this time. Right. So for Japan, well, most of Japan's import is actually not from Russia. They get a percentage of it from Russia, and but the high, the more of it, I think they get uh, from the UAE and all that, not from Russia. So uh, they are actually also trying to help the other Asian countries to cut off um, dependence on Russian oil. And uh, another area they are looking at, so the US is also in this is to look at the clean energy you know long before renewable now, energy yeah renewable mm -hmm. energy we've been talking about this the world has been talking about this but what uh, is the world doing about it talk exactly a lot about it, maybe this will push the world to really do something just maybe mm -hmm. because it's not really that easy to cut off coal mm -hmm. it's not really that easy to cut off oil mm -hmm. you know uh, and, it's, and the switch cannot just happen like that. It's going mm -hmm. to take time. It's going to take a lot of infrastructural development. It's because, even more expensive, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is expensive, very capital intensive. Although what they say is after the initial capital um, uh, expenses, then maintaining it might be cheaper for the environment, for the economy and all that. But I mean, uh, let's see what they come They come to. The US is helping. UK is also helping. Uh, UK is very self-reliant, you know, when it comes to oil and gas. Uh, they're about 90%. In fact, uh, research shows that if they don't import or do anything for the next five years, they're good with their oil reserve for the UK. And then for their gas, they, they get it directly from the North Sea and then got to get a bit of it from Norway. So they're quite self-sufficient. So if the UK says they're going to help, perhaps they will share part of their reserve. But, I mean, India has a huge, huge demand that might be very difficult. Yeah, and India has a huge amount for almost everything. For actually. almost everything. They have a, yeah. a huge population. Huge population, but so. China is still the largest uh, mm. uh, uh, demand or supplier of so, that. So the US president is planning to speak with uh, G7 uh, leaders, you know, regarding more sanctions on Russia. What could they possibly impose on Russia this time? Yeah, well, I think that the attention is shifting now. I mentioned to you the issue of insurance. You know, I think the attention is shifting more to logistics and supply, transportation of crude, while the EU has set a date, you know, for the end of the year for, for that. I think the conversation now is looking more into insurance, transportation, logistics, banks, you know, that can facilitate some of this. So even countries like China and India, you know, who are still purchasing the Russian oil at discounted rates might uh, be discouraged because you don't have, if you don't have logistics, you know, that would transport it, then where do you go to? Insurance companies are really getting attention at this time. Yeah, I also wanted to point out too, Hungary says it cannot yes. keep up, you know,
know, you know, they said that right from the very beginning. I mean, I think that one of the major discordants in in that conversation. They are. They are. They are. And 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 here's the thing. You know, they they they're very dependent on Russian uh, uh, oil and gas. You know, and nobody really is talking about. You know, you know, the European Union Commission president has not. You know, explained in details. You know, what exactly this He's new be the round of sanctions uh, will be for Russia. And you know what the impacts will be on those smaller European countries. Exactly, And they yes. feel that the big ones are making the decisions and are not and considering they're ignoring the their impacts. own economies. Yes, yeah. I mean, what's Bulgaria doing now? You know, what? how are they helping themselves out? Germany, how they have their own um, uh, strategy, which they have activated, mm -hmm. you know, and now we're talking of China and India getting attention from the US and the UK. But as you mentioned, who is taking care of, of these guys? Who's going to take care of their needs? and what's going to happen to their citizens. You know, there's self-preservation first before. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, this. I think this has been an issue in the bloc, in the, in the European bloc for a while because the economies are not balanced. Right. So sometimes even when they give like a blanket rate or you talk about the value of the currency, it's I mean, it's not... For them to yeah, keep exactly. Mm. Any uh, lovely conversations with you as always. I'll see you later. Thank uh, you. Have a great show. Coming Thank up you. In just a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. Now, yesterday, Russian missiles hit uh, electrical substations in the Ukrainian city of Lviv. Uh, people are currently without water and without power. There's more in this report. The power station in Ukraine's western city of Lviv was damaged by an airstrike on Tuesday. Mayor of the city, Andriy Zdovi, says the airstrikes on the power station cut off electricity in some districts and that water networks in his city near the Polish border, across which flow Western arms supplies for Ukraine's military, were also damaged during the strikes. Russia has turned its heaviest firepower on Ukraine's east and south since failing to take key of the capital in March. But it has also struck much further west in a drive to limit Ukraine's access to the Black Sea, vital for its gains and metal exports, and also to disrupt supplies of Western military aid to President Volodymyr Zelensky's force. Firefighters battled Tuesday night to put out the blaze. The explosions happened nearly 10 weeks into a war that has killed thousands, devastated cities, and driven 5 million Ukrainians to flee abroad. The city has been spared most of the fighting since the invasion of Ukraine. Lviv is hundreds of miles from Russia's advance, and it has been one of the main destinations for Ukrainians forced to flee battle zones. Ukraine's defense ministry says Russia is attempting to increase tempo of its offensive in the east of the country. The defense ministry spokesman gave few details but said Moscow had conducted nearly 50 airstrikes on Tuesday, May the 3rd alone. He also said Russian artillery fire and airstrikes were continuing periodically on the Azovstal steelworks in Mariupol, where the last Ukrainian defenders of the southern port city hold up. On Wednesday, Russia's defense ministry said it had disabled six railway stations in Ukraine, used to supply Ukrainian forces with Western-made weapons in the country's east. The ministry said it had disabled the railway stations by bombing their power supplies using high-precision air and sea-based weapons. It did not say which Western-made weapons were supplied to Ukrainian forces via those stations. The ministry also said it had hit 40 Ukrainian military targets, including four depots storing ammunition and artillery weapons. They also published video footage of the cruise missiles being launched from the Black Sea and said they had hit unspecified ground targets in Ukraine. Meanwhile, a large fire engulfed an oil storage in the town of Makivka in the Donetsk region Wednesday morning. Russia-backed authorities in the area said the site had been the target of a missile strike by the Ukrainian military, but provided no evidence to support the claim. Russia, on the other hand, has reiterated a warning that it will seek to destroy convoys of armed shipments to Ukraine from Western countries, which in recent weeks have stepped up these supplies. The United States and its NATO allies are continuing to pump weapons into Ukraine, so says Russia's defense minister, and that any transport of the North Atlantic Alliance arriving on the territory of the country with weapons or materials destined to the Ukrainian army as a legitimate target will be destroyed. 
And uh, just before we go on to sports stories, we have this update. Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko says Ukraine is provoking Russia, adding, we have done and are doing everything now so that there isn't a war. We'll have more on this later. Meanwhile, tributes have been paid to Ukrainian shooters Ivan Bidyank and Ihor Kihitov, who died during Russia's invasion of the country. Bidyank reportedly died on April 20 after being shot in the Kherson region of Ukraine. A 36-year-old had represented Ukraine at international level for several years, including competing at the World and European Championships. He earned Ukraine's first shooting quota place for the London 2012 Olympic Games. Bidyank was also a member of the bronze medal winning pistol team, a team at the European Championships in 2013. Kirov, a member of the Ukrainian junior shooting team, was killed during shelling in the city of Popasana. A funeral was held for the 21-year-old last month. His twin brother, Kilib, who was also a shooter, was there. That's the program today. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi. Bye.